Yeah, um, so I'm Tim Panton. Um, current business card says protocol droid, which is what I actually like doing, implementing protocols, but also explaining the kind of human cyborg interaction thing of, of translating from geek to, uh, to real life and back again. Um, I'm Steely Glint on Twitter. Uh, feel free to tweet at me if you've got questions and stuff. So, uh, but I wanted to kind of kick back with some um, recent news. Um, you know, uh, Fiat got, uh, got their Jeep hacked um, because they thought they had a VPN when they kind of didn't. Um, and they didn't authenticate who was talking to it correctly and they didn't have a, the right level of firewall. Um, this, these guys have got a, a sniper rifle, which for reasons are completely, I mean, I'm too British to understand, has Wi-Fi enabled gun sites. <laughs> Um, and it can be hacked by the Wi-Fi, so that, and bizarrely, if you change the gravity constant, you can make the things um, aim wrong and hit the wrong target. Um, and again, uh, this guy, this is brilliant, right? This guy has a hacked version of the a AR drone, which, when it sees another a AR drone, it co-ops it and makes it follow it. So it can basically, a, it's, a viral, uh, it's a viral set of AR drones. And basically, again, because this is open Wi-Fi. Um, with no authentication. Nest, um, earlier this week, was down, uh, along with Dropbox, so that your, dis even if your baby cam was in the same room, on the same Wi-Fi as your handset, you still couldn't talk to it because it went through a server in Utah, or wherever they host their servers. This is a, a big thing in Britain. Um, these guys had uh, the Information Commissioner, which is a branch of government in the UK, issued a letter to all webcam manu manufacturers telling them not to release webcams that use passwords. And if they, if they must use passwords, then they must disable the webcam until the password has been changed to a strong one. So that's, that's the regulator starting to get involved in internet security, which is kind of fun. Um, and these guys, so the FDA, same thing here. The FDA have withdrawn a pump, um, an insulin pump, I think, uh, because it could be hacked over the hospital network that wasn't properly filed or authenticated. So my, my, my message here is that security isn't what it was. Like, you know, the old thing of knocking on the postern gate of the castle and being challenged for a password, it doesn't work in the new world, right? We've been stuck in that, in that security mode for too long, and it doesn't work anymore. Now, the ideal protocol for the internet of everything would be, you know, it would be a standard protocol, obviously. It would be secure. It would have a wide deployment. It would be peer-to-peer -peer with NAT traversal, so that it didn't matter if you were on 3G or 4G or, or whatever, um, you know, or on your Wi-Fi. It would be real-time, because you need, you know, baby monitors and drug pumps. You don't want to delay this stuff. Um, you would want um, strong identity management, so you can control who's accessing the brakes in your car. and you want it to be mobile capable because most of the time at least one endpoint is going to be a smartphone. The other one's probably going to be a device, but you want that. And it want the bottom line and the, the summary of all this is it's got to be focused on the user. It's got to be around what the user needs. So you look at that and you think, well, the RTC web protocol that goes over the wire has the following attributes. It's standardized, it's secure, it's widely deployed, um, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's got real, it's obviously real time. The identity thing, not so much, but there are, you know, people are working on it, it's getting there. Um, and it's mobile capable, and possibly on smaller things. So, and it's uh, user-centric. So maybe there's something we could do that. So what I decided to do for this, this demo is to build something that is real-time authenticated, peer-to-peer -peer communication between a small device and a WebRTC browser. And obviously using the data channel, um, Unless, obviously, not using any passwords anywhere. Because, let's face it, we all hate passwords. So, the components we're going to need for this is WebRTC Data Channel app in the smartphone, um, WebRTC Data Channel app in an embedded device, a WebRTC service so that they can meet up, and some sort of pairing so that they know who they're talking to, and that that relationship is well established. So what we're going to use is Chrome for Android. Well, actually, because of the AV, AV thing, I'm going to do it on the Mac, but it could perfectly well be on Android. Or indeed, it could be 
a CocoaPod or whatever, you know, it's standard WebRTC, basically. I'm going to run a lightweight stack on the device. Um, I've written a very simple um, WebSocket message hub um, just because I can, and it's on GitHub there if you want it. And actually, all of the HTML5 for the examples are in that uh, Git repository as well. Um, and I'm going to use QR code pairing. Um, just actually kind of fun because it uses get user media, so it's even more WebRTC-ish. Um, and I'm going to use a duckling protocol. So described by Ross Anderson in the 90s, he's a prof of computer science uh, at Cambridge, um, Cambridge, UK. Um, it, and basically what it, what it models is the idea that a device trusts the first thing it sees. So, I mean, this is supposedly true of duckling. I don't know if it actually is, but um, that, you know, a duckling recognizes its mother because that's the first thing it saw when it came out of the shell. Um, and so, actually, we flip this relationship around because most small devices don't have cameras and most smartphones do. So, actually, we turn it around. We have the, um, the uh, device showing the QR code and um, the smartphone seeing it, scanning it, and making a call. And then that only happens once at the kind of hatching stage when you first switch a device on, when you unpack it from the Amazon package or whatever. And at that point, it becomes uh, your device and you claim ownership. So um, now I'm going to attempt to demo what that looks like for users. Now, this screen is more resolution than I expected. so. Um, let's make it a bit bigger and like that. Uh, okay, that'll do. Right, so um, not quite the effect I had in mind, but it'll do. So uh, to riff off the original um, remark about uh, YoPet, this is the, the app I wrote for last year, but with added, um, with added pairing. Because basically last year I totally avoided the whole issue of um, how do you pair up two devices? So I figured this, this year I'd probably better fix that. So the idea is you have um, your pet has, um, has an app on their tablet, which you put in front of their cage or wherever. Um, and so the, the model is you, you first, when you first get this, this app, you start it up, and it shows a QR code. It says, please show this to your, your handset, or in this case, your... Um, Actually, this will happen quite quickly, so I'm going to... Um, or, or show it to your, your uh, um, you know, in this case, your, your browser in your desktop. And you show the two to each other. And a few seconds later, it sets up a quick test call, and then you're paired. From that point on, these two devices will not speak to anybody else. Like, they know about their pairing relationship from then on. Um, and then the net re result of that is that um, I can put this down over here and place a video call to it with any luck. And uh, yes, we have a video call. So I mean, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but actually it's nice that I didn't do an an answer on that. I didn't accept it. I didn't have to check it, log in, check in. No passwords were exchanged. Um, well, switch that off. And, and you know, there's some other features, like you need to be able to forget the tablet and whatever else. Right. So you've seen what the QR code exchange looks like. Um, now I need to get my browser back. There we go. So that, that QR code exchange is actually a pretty simple um, you know, experience for the user. So next thing, um, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, is the code. Now I wonder if this is going to work. Probably not, actually. Um, is the code for the, mm, I, oh yes, I do know how to do this. So the, I'm just going to show you the, a tiny bit of code for the exchange of, there's a mode for this. View presenter mode, there we go, that's what we're doing. Whoa, there we go. Right, so um, th this is a, the, this little WebRTC rendezvous service runs in a server. Um, it's actually written in Scala, which I really like. It's great for the kind of central services things. Um, 
And basically, all it does is it takes a, takes a WebSocket. When you connect to it to a WebSocket, you, in, you assert an identity, in this case, the whatever was actually in your QR code on one end and the equivalent on the other. You assert an identity, and then when a message comes in, um, this device just basically passes it out to the correct, um, uh, the correct device within the, within the mesh. So it's basically a, a message passing thing, looks at the to address and sends it. It takes, doesn't try and validate anything, it just passes them around. There's no kind of, no, um, there's actually no management in there, it's just a message bus. Now, how do I get out of this mode? Yeah, no, it should be escape, but it isn't. Um, I, I fell for that earlier when I tried it. <laughs> um, right, so um, that's Fingersmith. Again, that's actually in that GitHub repository. You're welcome to improve it, please. Um, so the question, interesting question is, what do we use as an address? What was in that QR code? Um, you know, WebRTC has no intrinsic identity built in, and that was a design decision and one I wholly approve of. Um, but it doesn't have an identity in there. So, I mean, you know, the obvious thing to do is to use a random key. And if you look at something like XMPP in the anonymous mode, the server generates a random key, um, you know, random hold, a random token, which you could then use. Um, or you can do what, you know, what's available in, in Twilio and Respoke, where the client side can generate an identity and assert an identity and just say, I am Fred. Um, that's fine, and, and that's what we're exchanging in the QR code. We've taken the second approach that the, the endpoint claims a, an identity, a random identity in this case, um, but persistent over the life of the, um, of the app. Um, exchanged over the QR code at hatching and stored locally and reused for life. And what I, by mean life, I mean in this case it might be the life of the, well, the tablet actually. Um, or at any rate, however long you've got the app installed on the tablet. So, now, full disclosure, this is such a good idea, I filed a patent on it. So, if anybody kind of wants to blank their, their eyes and ears at this point, feel free. Um, so, there's this fingerprint thing loafing around in the STP. It looks kind of random. Maybe we could do something with it. It's, a, it's actually the hash on the X509 certificate used in the DTLS exchange. Can you use it as an address? Well, actually, yes. And if you do, then all sorts of fun crypto properties drop out for free. Basically, you don't have to trust the signaling server anymore. Um, I I'm going to give a talk at, at the um, Illinois Institute of Technology in uh, Chicago uh, about three weeks' time. Well, I'll talk about basically the whole talk is about that. Um, they wouldn't let me do that here, so. So, uh, but it basically lets the duckling tell that mummy is calling and ignores everybody else, all the other ducks. So, um, another little bit of JavaScript walk through here. Because I'm supposed to do code, you see, so. Um, so, local host, mm -hmm, fine. Right, so this is um, what we're gonna see in a minute, but for the moment, let's just look at the Source. Okay, so um, where are we? So this is the, here we go, classic um, JavaScript. You end end up reading it backwards. Um, so the at the end we have this on on document ready function, um, and basically what this does is it uses a little library I've written called Ipsorama, which goes off and tries to find out what the fingerprint is for the current device, um, and and then so it can then use it and assert it. So it does this by um, uh, wherever it's gone somewhere. The indenting's gone wrong. So it does this by where's it gone? <laughs> oh yes, of course. It does this by using another library. Um, so it uses the Ipsorama library. I wonder if this will, yes, excellent. So it does this by using the Ipsorama library, and what the Ipsorama, Ipsorama library does is, who am I, basically does a fake, generates a fake offer. So it generates an offer, which is then gonna throw away, and it then passes that offer 
to a library which actually I wrote with a friend of mine, Neil Stratford, whilst we were working at Tropo, called Phono SDP, which parses, a, um, which parses the uh, SDP into a decently shaped JSON object. And then you can go and dig in the JSON object and pull the fingerprint out. Now, with ORTC, I no longer need to do that. I can go and ask the object. Um, but for the moment, um, so you see here, this is what the, we call a Phono library with the description, and we pull out a fingerprint by digging down into the SDP contents fingerprint print. Uh, it's, it's, it's not horrendously ugly, but the, actually the phono.sdp library is not beautiful. Anyway, so having done that, you, you have the fingerprint, you establish your WebSocket connection to, in this case, Fingersmith, and you say, right, I'm connected and I am this identity, which is you know, 32 not exactly random bytes. So, back to the presentation, hopefully. So, um, generate dummy offer, use phono.stp.js to parse that dummy offer, extract the fingerprint, um, thanks to Tropo for making that open source. Um, Ipsorama sets up the data channel via Fingersmith. And we have to use generate certificate and index DB to make sure that that certificate is consistently used throughout the life, throughout my use of this app. Um, and Chrome, the default behavior at the moment is that, but I understand from the conversation earlier that that will, not lo will, will soon cease to be the case. And we'll have to use the, um, the generate certificate and index DB um, on both platforms, which is fine, because that's the standard. So um, on the device side, I have a set of choices about what I can use in terms of what the platform is. Um, so I mean, an obvious choice would be to use JavaScript. And then, so I'd probably take the WebRTC code dump, compile it onto my little Linux platform, or cross-compile it onto my little Linux form, and then wrap it in Node and use that. And that's possible, but there's an awful lot of stuff there I don't need, like video codecs and things. Um, the, other th the other approach would be to take an existing C or C++ library like, uh, like Janus from the MeTeco guys, and, um, and, and again, cut out the stuff I don't need because they're very server-based, and I actually want to run this on a tiny endpoint. Um, or I can kind of do something foolish and do it in Java and DIY. So, you know, those of you who know me will guess exactly what I did, which is I did it the Java way. Um, fortunately, there's lots of helpful stuff out there. Um, my friend Emil has, has uh, wrote a, a very nice Ice4J stack, so the Ice stuff sorted out, and that does turn and stun, and I'm happy with that. The Bouncy Castle guys um, wrote a DTLS stack, which uh, actually Tropo funded. Um, so that's great. That's out there. They're, they're now bought by Cisco, so not too bad. Unfortunately, there isn't an open source SCTP stack in Java, so I have to write one. Um, so now, um, you can demo on the BeagleBone. Now, you, think about, you have to think about the BeagleBone as like the American version of the, um, of the Raspberry Pi. It's a little ARM device. Um, I think it's 600 megahertz, half a gig of memory, uh, and a little bit of flash. It's actually a slightly nicer platform than the Pi. Um, and it runs, runs, um, runs a reasonable Linux. So now, back to the, um, this web page. Oh, no. Oh. First, we have to set the Pi running. So on the, it isn't a Pi, on the BeagleBone, we're going to start a Java library. Um, my my big Java library. Let me try and make that a bit bigger for you. Right, so this is, this should now, there we go. Yeah, you need to see this, really. There you go. So this is a, this is a beagle bone, um, and it's now running. It's drawn a QR code, and if I hold it close enough, we'll recognize it, and then we can press connect. And now we see my totally unoptimized Java hopefully gets an offer any second now. There we go. Um, and hopefully it sends back an answer with any luck. Yeah, looking good. And now it's done the ICE tr transaction. It's starting SCTP. And look, 
it's running, it's echoing my packets, my, my DTLS packets. Um, now, there are a couple of interesting things to say about that, about why you would bother to do that when you've got a perfectly good uh, WebSocket server. There are two really good reasons. One of them, I'm going to show you now if I can um, uh, remember how. There we go. That's one, which is that we've got, um, even on a, on a relatively slow device, and bear in mind, it's writing to this the serial port, so it's doing stuff slowly, um, got a round trip time of like 30 milliseconds. Um, be hard to do that with a server out in the cloud and back to a small device. Um, so it's like, you know, there's a, the, the round trip time is, is short, and, and there's a stack of optimization I could do to make that shorter. And then the other thing is, I can, with any luck, Uh, hmm, I can't see this. Well, uh, if I could find the window it's running in, I could kill the WebSocket server, but I can't actually find it. Um, and it would still work. Point being that it's not going through the WebSockets, and so that would still continue to work. Um, however, so that's, you know, mm, data channel running on a small device. Right. Back to the story. So I know there's an argument basically which says, actually, you're cheating, right? A bigger bone is, is a, you know, it's a credit card size. That's and it's it's got half a half a gig of RAM. You know, that's not a real device. Real devices are ARM nines with 300 megahertz and and 64 meg of memory. And I would counter that by pointing out that what Intel think an IoT device looks like is this. Right, this is the Intel Edison, um, and it's a dual core x86 architecture, dual 500 megahertz with a gig of memory. Right, so actually, you look not too far in the, in the future, you could expect to find this in your thermostat. But I, I, I understand that there will be platforms where that's not appropriate. So I give in. I went out and bought myself a toy. I bought myself a Lego EV3. Now, the EV3 is exactly that spec. It's a 300 megahertz um, ARM9 running Linux. And <laughs> some clown has, it's open source, right? So some clown rebuilt the OS so that it took all the Lego stuff out. and. It's a, you run a plain Linux, and then some other clown, and I, I just admire the open source community for this, went and put a Java API on it. So all of these things, <laughs> right, all of these devices on here, these sensors and these motors, actually have Java APIs to them. And that, I'm afraid to me, that's utterly irresistible. <laughs> right, so um, now, so this thing, I, mm, mm, um, if I put him on there, he'll run away and fall off. So. Um, I'm going to put it in there, and, and we'll, it, it, nothing will happen for several minutes because I have some typing to do. But um, right, so now uh, let's stop the beagle bone because that's a distraction, and let's make the let's make. So this is, I mean, you know, this is just bizarre, right? I'm logging into my, my electronic dog here. Um, and and like, this, is, this is absolutely typical. No password, right? Anyway. Um, uh, fortunately, it's on closed Wi-Fi. Right, so um, actually, speaking of closed Wi-Fi, I think we might need to be a bit Closer. Right. So I need to kill. Um, kill, kill. Now I need to kill the current menuing system that's running on there. Because we don't want any menus. We don't do menus. Right. So with any luck, the screen's gone? E excellent. Right. Now, this is the bit where actually. I asked Billy, but he's not here. I asked Billy to stand around and, and fill for me, because this takes ages. 
but it's fine. You stay there, and I'll just blab. Um, so starting Java on a 300 megahertz ARM and pulling in the DTLS crypto library um, takes a few seconds. And then pulling in the WebSocket library takes a little longer. And then running over the keys, uh, running the, the, the hash over the keys so that it knows what the certificate is took a little longer. And now it's going to go and try and talk to the WebSocket server. And it will get there. I mean, this is all available for optimization. I, I, I had this working, first got this working earlier this week, and I first got it reliably working yesterday. And I say reliably, but it may not actually turn out that way. So it should now be just about to talk to the WebSocket server. Come on. There we go. So we're now on the WebSocket. We're doing that. So now we need to talk to it. So unsurprisingly, we have a very similar user interface. Oh, I just made a tactical error. Um, so you've got a QR code down there. Now, um, for two reasons, one of which is that it's over there and this is here. And, and actually, because the camera on here doesn't like the lighting, I'm going to cheat. Um, I took a picture of the QR code earlier. <laughs> No, it, it, it's, it's fine. I took a picture of the QR code earlier um, because uh, I knew that, that it's not, the problem is that that screen isn't backlit and it actually is a lot of reflection off it. Um, as you will see from the picture, actually. So with any luck, if I hold this in the right place, we will, oh, come on, you can do it. And the other thing is, if I get, there we go, got it. Right, so we now have the QR code exchanged, and we now start talking to it. Now, this actually also um, <laughs> takes a little while. There we go, offer gone, answer coming back. Gathering candidates. It goes out for a turn server, I shall be annoyed. <laughs> but, I mean, hey, it'll work, which is the important thing. So DTLS packets are going. We have sent the certificate, but we haven't got one back yet. And that's timed out. Oh, that's looking good. Yes, we now have a data channel running. And which means that, at least in theory, I should be able to drive this thing. Uh, I, need to, I can't actually see where I'm going. I need to, I need to put a camera on it. All right, turn right a bit. There we go. Have I gone too far? Uh, turn left a bit. Oh! Anyway, so my Lego building skills aren't quite what they should be. But, um, uh, yeah, actually, there's, there's a whole API for how fast you want to accelerate. But I didn't have time. Anyway, so the, the point being that I have a DTLS exchange with, I have, anyway, whatever. Um, and no passwords were harmed in this in this in this, <laughs> in this exchange. So, oh yeah, the demo. Right. So by using WebRTC data channel, we have used a standardized, secure, widely deployed peer-to-peer, real-time, strong identity management to a mobile small device. You and it's well fairly user-centric. So. I, the big takeaway message is WebRTC isn't just for video calls. There are other things you can do with it, and particularly the data channel can solve interesting problems in the Internet of Everything space. So that's me.